instead of finding the next buyer, I said, how can we be the next buyer? Welcome to the Wild West Real Estate Podcast. And now, here's your host, Mark Hinteman. Today's guest is a former restaurateur turned real estate investor, focusing on multifamily and now hotel conversions. I'd like to welcome Dave Garpstis. Welcome, hey, Dave. Dave. Hey, Mark. How you doing, man? Great, great. How about yourself? Doing wonderful. Thanks for having me on. Of course. I'm excited to jump into your story. Um, so, yeah, give a little background. I know you're you're in uh, eastern Pennsylvania. Um what uh, what was your path that led you to uh, you know some multifamily and and now hotel conversions? Yeah, so I started out in uh, in high school, got into the restaurant game. My brother had uh, a bar and restaurant that I worked at, and we that career progressed. We ended up we bought uh, a bar and restaurant in Baltimore, ran that for a while, and then purchased a second location in Lancaster back home, and basically did that for the better part of my life and always knew that there was something else out there, um, had always had an interest in real estate and made uh, an initial real estate investment. Prior to really getting involved in real estate, I had made an investment into some raw land and a pre-construction project down in Belize. And that just kind of whet my appetite for, for getting into real estate. And through that, I ended up, to keep the story kind of short, decided to pursue real estate sales. And went from the restaurant and dove headfirst into selling real estate. And with that, I started to realize that there was a number of people who had come to me with these, these visions and, and ambitions to be financially independent and had zero properties to start with. They would come to me, we'd get on a buying plan, and next thing you know, they would be leaving their jobs. And here I was still hustling and trying to you know find new leads and new clients and started to realize I was on the wrong side of the table. So that led to us buying our first rental property in 2018. And then we just continued to buy scattered site, single family properties. Everything we did was value add. We bought with predominantly hard money just because I wanted to expedite the process. You know, we bought, we the first property we bought, we bought traditionally with, you know, 20% down actually with a set of partners. And it just, it took too long. You know, I just, I was ready to, to really explode and grow faster. So we started util utilizing hard money for anything we could find value add, would go through the whole bird process, refi, get it stabilized, move on to the next thing. But then through that, I realized that that wasn't fast enough and how many freaking doors I would need <laughs> for me to get, to get financial independence, which is what turned me on to multifamily. So oh, sure. we, we, had, we had a deal that I was actually representing a buyer on. It was 44 units right in our downtown Lancaster city, half a block off of the square. I mean, dynamite location, complete value add opportunity. Long story short, the buyer fell apart and, uh, or the deal fell apart, I should say, not the buyer. And uh, we ended up instead of, it was the first time in my life, in my career, instead of finding the next buyer, I said, how can we be the next buyer? And ultimately that's when I had started learning about syndication. So took a leap of faith through the property under contract without really having a good plan. And then from there decided, you know, we we're going to put it together and syndicate it. So we syndicated our first, our first deal. And then from there, uh, kind of got the bug for what multifamily could do and just continued on our journey to where we bought a few more buildings in Western part of Lancaster County. And we're currently with the multifamily space around 90, around 96 units. Okay. Oh, awesome. That's so cool. There's a couple things that you mentioned along the way that I'm intrigued by. So you bought, you bought land, like while you owned the restaurants and, and that's even interesting too. So you bought like, you know, as you emerged at, into adulthood, you bought a restaurant. Yeah. With so there brother, was, was it? yeah, with my brother and a handful of partners, we bought in Southwest Baltimore city. We found an old row home that was converted into a bar, like in the 1940s. <laughs> and owners were older, they needed to retire and get out. So we were able to, it was a good buy. It had an apartment upstairs, 
whole restaurant downstairs, liquor license, gaming machines, all kinds of stuff. So you bought uh, the property? Correct. Yep. Okay. Okay. Did you view it as a, as a real estate investment or did you uh, view it as a bar investment? More, I mean, for us, the real estate was always the security piece. You know, okay. we, we could dictate, you know, if things didn't work out, we'd have something that we could liquidate and make ourselves whole again. And that's kind of how we've always done everything. And it's, I just was never comfortable with, with making a rent payment with knowing that I was out of control and, or things were out of my control. I could have a landlord that jacked the rent. Oh, sure. that wanted to sell the property. So we always positioned ourselves in places where we could buy the asset and then run the business internally. Oh, cool. So that's, you're a true entrepreneur. Uh, just out of curiosity, what is a, what does it cost to buy a bar? What did, what do your bar cost? So the bar in Baltimore, we purchased uh, for three hundred seventy-five thousand, and it was about a twelve hundred square foot space on the on the main level, which we operated out of, and then had a two bedroom apartment upstairs, two bed one bath apartment. But that was liquor license, that was FFE, that was everything, and that was that was right when Baltimore was really starting to blow up. So it was was a great right time, right place kind of thing. Oh, cool. That's uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, everybody who you know obviously grows up. And maybe uh, the minority, but growing up and you become 20 years old and you're hanging out with bar with your buddies at bars uh, yeah. and never knew the, you know, never knew anyone who who actually owned it. And then the other thing that was interesting is you mentioned you bought pre-construction land in Belize. Yeah. Uh, yeah when was this? So this was actually before I met my now wife. I had flown down. I was I had saved up some money, was going through this this personal shift of like wanting to be somewhere than that other than central Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. And I had done a bunch of research and and one of the places that kept popping up was, was Ambergris Key Belize. And it was like, you know, everything that I had searched, it was coming up. It was the consistent, uh, the constant that came up and everything. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to reach out to a, a real estate agent in the community. I'm going to fly down. I'm just going to tour the properties, see what's going on in the community. And to be honest, between you and I, I had probably 30,000 in my my pocket at the time, nothing crazy, uh -huh. but they didn't know that. And they they took me as some big real estate investor and, you know, they wined and dined me. But the, the truth of the matter was, had I gone down as a tourist, I would have done touristy things. Going down as a real estate investor, I got to see the behind the scenes, the nuts and bolts, the important things as to to what made Belize a great investment spot. And when I had come back, they had they had shown me a pre-construction project down there that they were actually doing. So Ambergris is kind of like a backward sea and there's a bay community on, on the backside of the island and they were dredging their own islands and they were supposed to be making, it was 20, 27 little islands that they were going to be doing these casitas on and you could buy into the project and it was going to be just under $100,000 for the project and then about another 150 to build. And so I ended up, I bought into that with all the money I had had. And through that, which side story, that project ended up falling apart. So I'm actually still in, in dispute with getting my money back on that. Oh, but, you are? Okay. Yeah, but through all that, I was led to another development opportunity where the seller was financing. They had taken a huge parcel up on the Northwest part of the Island, subdivided it all and were seller financing these lots at 20 grand a piece. And I had then met my now wife and we had only been together about four months or so. And I had said to her, I'm like, hey, you want to buy some land in paradise? And she's like, all right, whatever. So she and I joined up and we ended up, we purchased four lots up there. I mean, we throw away more money on a, a monthly basis on dumb stuff than, than <laughs> so we said, what's the worst that could happen? So we ended up, we bought four lots up there. And yeah. right before COVID, we had the land cleared, surveyed, engaged an architect, started coming up with some plans and some prints on what we were going to do. And there was just something inside. It was just like, just hold off. It didn't feel right. And then just like that, COVID happened. And Really? Okay. So we're wow. just kind of sitting in limbo at this point. You are? Okay. Yeah. I uh, I got married in uh, Ambergris K, uh, oh, Belize. Where? Where? Uh, where? Uh, San Pedro. San Pedro. What was it? Like at the, yeah. the, the, a church there. Okay. Um, I think there's only one. <laughs> yeah. And then... We uh, spent the rest of the time up in, uh, it was called Matachica, up on yeah. uh, north of that. And I think yep. they switched owners. I don't know if that property is still there. Yeah, a fascinating. Um, I always always had some eye on like Belize as a, 
potential investment. It seems like it seems like it's a it's a really nice place. Obviously, you go there and you're like, oh, this is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, and the tough part about that was there was a lot of, and I know this isn't the direction of the podcast, but <laughs> there was a, you know, there there was a lot of Belize relying on everybody else to import everything. And I'm sure when you were there, you saw how freaking expensive stuff would be because although the you know the dollar conversion was easy, it's easy to get around. Like things were expensive unless you were buying local stuff. And yeah. within the last decade, there was a huge migration. It's even longer than a decade ago, but a huge migration of Mennonite population on mainland and who started bringing a lot of value to Belize as a country and becoming more self-sufficient. So when you would go down to, to Ambergris, then you could find local grade chicken, you could find local meats, local produces, you know, some things that weren't necessarily typical of Belize that you could start to find local dairy products, cheeses. So not everything was imported. So it became a little bit more affordable each and every time we would go down and it's changed and transitioned a lot. I mean, since we've been down there, they now have four flagship hotels on the island. So, you know, it's it's an exciting place to be. And, and I really think that there's a lot of opportunity and runway ahead of it. But I guess only time will tell. But, yeah, we love it down there. Yeah, interesting, because I, I have thought about that, you know, periodically. Like, if there's anywhere in Central or South America, I would invest in Belize. And, and maybe there's, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know enough about the economic factors long term, but it seems like that's an undiscovered, not it's, it's been discovered, but, uh, you know, it, it could have some growth ahead of it. Yeah. And if you ever need a place to put up a house, just give me a call. You can put, you can put a house on the land or whatever. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Yeah. So let's get back to, uh, uh, yeah, your multifamily. Sure. So you built your portfolio and, and how did that start? So the multifamily started with that first syndication. It yep. was a collection of six buildings. We bought with with a number of things in mind. And I've always been of, of the mindset of wanting to buy value add. We operate in the B minus C class type of real estate. And I would say it's it's intentional in a number of ways, but I, I would also say that it's where we could afford to get into the market. But <laughs> that's exactly me. Yeah. But it's, like uh... from but from like the you know from the B and C perspective, I feel like there's some safety in it if it's in a good area. A hundred percent. When for a number of reasons, there's there's a much larger demographic that we can cater to, you know, in good times, we have people that are scaling up to our B class. And in bad times, we have people that are scaling back to the C class. And again, we don't treat our assets any different than we would if it was a class A. I mean, we're still making sure, you know, safety, affordability, comfort are all priorities of ours. So we're not we're not treating it any different. But at the end of the day, to me, when I was looking at, especially because that first project, we went under contract in February of 2020 and, you know, pre, pre-COVID, we were scheduled to close the end of March of that year. And obviously COVID happened and everything got thrown out of whack. And I had a number of investors that were positioned in the deal, handful of them backed out. I mean, I had two really large investors that a week before closed because of COVID decided, you know, we're out. Thankfully, the seller's had a little bit of grace and were willing to, with everything that was going on, allow me to buy some time, which gave me an opportunity to go out and, and do a little bit more fundraising and capital raising. So was able to pull the money together to close the deal. But it was a challenging time. But what I found was, just like a lot of other people, that being in that BC class position, people wanted the one thing that they had that was certain in their life, and that was their housing. So our collection rate was great through it all. Lancaster City, and just like a lot of other communities, had a lot of affordable housing, like uh, housing subsidy uh, programs that people can participate in. We had a number of different uh, economic, economic disaster relief payment programs that people could get involved with. So collection rates and the performance of that asset were fantastic. It is, I would say, a little bit more labor intensive than probably your A class, but we bought with the understanding that, you know, what was there, we can run it. We can make some improvements. Some of the rents were below market. We were able to creep some of those up. We were able to tighten up some of the things that were just, you know, just I'm sure with the buildings you have going in and really going through with a fine tooth comb and just where can we tighten up our expenses? You know, how many how many toilets are running that we're not aware of? So we were getting more consistent with walkthroughs. But strategically, we bought this set specifically because there is a large 55 and over retirement community, Willow Valley, which I know a lot of people in the nation have heard of. It's top 10 
retirement communities in the nation are building an urban facility less than a half a block away. And it's going to be a 23 story tower, which is pretty big for our city. And we're less than a half a block away. And so we knew a number of things. One, that the cash flow was good. We underwrited to a point where we were super conservative. We knew we could maintain what was there and to make some improvements. But we also, we knew we had appreciation as another layer of insulation, another icing on the cake, if you will, to, to make sure that when our investors got into bed in the deal, that we could meet good on where we were at and also provide them some protection with all the uncertainty that we were going through. Right. First of all, yeah, I, I have the exact same experience that you had in terms of entering like the BC class tier of the market. And I was in LA and I just had limited funds. So I, I, I bought what I could afford and it was always B class value add, C class. And then, and this was back in like the early 2000s, when 2008 hit, I was doing my first syndication with uh, a bunch of partners that I worked with and saw every day. So I was like, oh crap, like I'm going to yeah. lose, I'm, this is the first time I'm going to lose money and it's going to be surrounded by like, along with like a bunch of my coworkers that I see every day who are, will never let me hear the end of it. Right. But to my shock and surprise, as we were going through the carnage of 2008, and everything was crashing, our rents were growing and we stayed full in these properties. And I was like, what's happening? Like, why am I? And it was because everybody was moving down from A class into B and C class. And, uh, you know, people were losing their jobs and experiencing salary cuts. And also there was a lot of foreclosures in 08, which meant, you know, there was a ton of people in Southern California who were losing their houses unfortunately, and they were becoming renters. And all of that was putting demand on those B and C class units. And uh, like you said, they were affordable. They're, they're the most affordable tier of the market. Nowadays, at least for the last five years or something, uh, A class has been surging and doing really well. And you know that's, that's my only thought on that could change abruptly. <laughs> yeah. And I like for me, again, B or C, as long as it's, you know, we're maintaining the asset and providing good, safe, quality housing, like we're not buying those types of properties in war zones, so to speak. Right. Um, you know, and and I, I think there's a stigma to the, the type or quality of maybe tenant applications and things you may get. And from my perspective, I mean, we, we've had properties in some rough areas. There's there's great people that rent everywhere. And if you're Absolutely. providing that good quality asset, no matter what what classification you give that asset, you're going to find a tenant. And if you put a good a good tenant who, you know, you screen correctly, they, you know, you've done your income verification, you know, all the the normal things you would do, if you place a good person into that property, the headaches of owning a quote unquote C class property really get diminished. Right. And I know it's not like that everywhere. I mean, I'm from a small town, so I can't sit and say, you know, it's not like I'm buying in Detroit or some of these other places that, you know, maybe are a little bit more challenging. But, you know, putting good quality tenants in different places and taking care of the asset really changes the stigma of what a B or C can be. Yeah. And what you had mentioned is, yeah, you're um, the market that you're in. I, I had the maybe false assumption that that B and C class investing is best in major cities because I just maybe because I did it in LA and I had that experience is like, yeah, I have, I have workforce housing. People need, you know, this isn't a dangerous demographic who's, who I'm renting to. They're, they're great. They're so dependable. A lot of them are, you know, there's immigrants. It's, they're just blue collar people and and they, they're great tenants. So no issues on the tenant side. I thought maybe like I grew up in Cleveland and in parts of Cleveland, I wouldn't, wouldn't buy, wouldn't invest in B or C class. And that was maybe I'm biased or judging that from about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, where it yeah. was rough. But, you know, now I, I thought, I thought maybe major cities, B and C class was good, but you're, you're saying, yeah, just it, it, where you are is, is it works as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cool. Very very dependable. Yeah. And there's other reasons. I don't, I don't want to go on a, 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 a go on a, a tear on a B and C class versus a class, but 
you know, all they build during booms is a class. So, you know, the, the a class gets a little bit flooded very late in an economic cycle. Yeah. I mean, without, without grant funding or other secondary forms of, of funding, like through, through government entities, like you can't build B and C today. You just can't, you right. can't, it's just, there's no affordable way to do it. And then, you know, nobody but, does it. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you do, then, you know, you're capped for a 10 year window, most places for, you know, needing to stay at market and you can't follow. If you see a spike in rents, you're kind of capped on where you can go. So. Right. But it is too true to your comment that, uh, yeah, uh, there's no perfect asset class. And, and when you buy B and C class, you know, you, you've got to put a little more effort in, uh, increase your, uh, your CapEx budgets because yep. there's going to be stuff to fix. Yes, sir. And that's all part of it. <laughs> yeah, it's all part of it. Um, so I know you went into, you got into hotels. How did this happen? And tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So when we went, we went from that first syndication, we ended up buying a handful of other apartment buildings in the Western part of the County. And again, just following this vision of wanting to grow and grow my net worth and grow my, you know, my future financial success. And there was just something that was missing there. And in conjunction with doing all the, the multifamily stuff, my business specifically, we do, uh, we operate in short-term rentals, you know, scattered site, short-term rentals. Okay. And it was one of those things that I've always been looking for a way to, to scale the short-term rental business, you know, and yeah. just like going from single family to multifamily, the next logical step for me was, well, a motel. And, you know, we drove, we drive by these roadside motels on a regular basis and, you know, they're poised and ready to go. And, to me, it's it's the multifamily of short-term rentals. So we started exploring the desire to purchase a motel probably about a year ago. Started walking different properties. Nothing just really fit and felt right. And obviously being in close proximity to the Pocono Mountains, Poconos are fantastic for a number of different reasons. But the tourist base is insane. They have about a nine to 10 month rental season, just that there's a ton of activity up there. So, you know, we started looking at a couple different places up there and just happened to stumble across the one that we ended up purchasing. It had everything that, you know, your quintessential Pocono mountain type resort, very much in nature, huge sprawling. Uh, it's, it's just under four acres. I mean, but it had just like we would look with our multifamily stuff. It checked all the boxes, you know, the location was great. We had a, a, a tired seller who just needed to essentially get out. They had done all the heavy lifting for it. They had put a new roof on, new plumbing, new electrical about six years ago. So the infrastructure was good. The thing that was missing was operations and cosmetics. And those are two things that are relatively easy, expensive, yeah. easy to get in, implement, and bring back to market. So for me, the, the, mo the motel space is exciting to me because of being able to provide experience for people. As a kid, we used to travel a lot. When I say a lot, day trips, night, maybe overnights. We didn't have money growing up. So my mom and dad would always take us to these roadside motels. Some of them questionable, some of them whatever. <laughs> when I would be in the moment, probably wasn't the happiest. But when I look back now, some of my fondest memories were, were in you know spending time with my parents at those places. So <laughs> be, to be a part of being able to bring that to market and be the person and the team who helps bring those places online to help people create those memories is huge for me. But again, like I said earlier, it works just like multifamily. It's no different. You know, your economy is a scale is a lot better. You're you're overlaying from a single family to a multifamily. You're overlaying from a single family to multifamily here. It's just really just broadening the horizons on on what short term rentals is. So, yeah, that's cool. So you do you operate it? Do you call it a motel still, or is it just uh, is it just Airbnbs? Yeah, I mean we're we're using Airbnb platforms and overlaying okay. that to a motel, but yeah, it's still it's still going to be run and listed as a motel. Our goal is to break away from, you know, being tied to Airbnb and get more direct bookings and and on site just inquiries as people come up. But but yeah, I mean it's for all intents and purposes it's still a motel, and I think that's what's that's what's great about it. I mean, at one point in time, that motel when it was built was like a landmark for the community. You know what I mean? Like it was it provided a ton and it was probably one of the only places up there where people would come and be able to stay. Yeah. And it's just us being able to just as you do with properties, go in and breathe life back into it and let people see like, all right, it's under new ownership. Like they're doing some cool stuff. It looks completely different, but 
yeah, I mean, it's for me, I, I love the nostalgia of what a roadside motel is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was the same way S stuck uh, all the kids in the back of a of a car or a station wagon. Nobody has those anymore. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and then and staying it, in a motel along, you know, on your trip. This, yeah, the car, the the station wagons where the ceiling would like start falling in with the, the <laughs> right. The I fabric, remember. the yeah. fabric on the ceiling would just exactly. hang down. I vivid, you know, I, 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 this is decades after I was doing those trips as a kid, but as, as like a 30 year old, my friend, we lived in New York city and we wanted to go to Lake Placid and my friend, uh, drove his, his parents station wagon that had that like felt or whatever it was, that material hanging down. So that, so that you couldn't see out the rear window, yep. <laughs> the ceiling was sagging. Yeah. Fun time now, in that area. And that's not too far from there. Right. I mean, it's uh, New York, right? Upstate New York. About, about two hours. Yeah. Okay. Um, awesome. Yeah. Great. I, I am now intrigued by the, uh, the motel. I've been intrigued by short-term rentals for a long time, you know, but I've been sticking with uh, multifamily forever. And then, you know, there's just like everywhere else, the competition of multifamily around around Lancaster is insane. You know, and it's you think you're getting an exclusivity on a deal because, you know, a guy who's who's owned properties forever. And he calls. He's like, hey, I think I'm, I'm going to get rid of this property. Great. We'll bring you an offer. All right. Well, I need to let these other people through, too. And it's just like, ah, so. <laughs> But, you know, the competition, it, it is what it is, but the multifamily like or the the motel, we didn't see the competition level there, but the cash flow on it. I mean, everything that you would underwrite for multifamily, you're underwriting for a motel and we have the ability to automate everything for the motel, just as like you can build your systems for multifamily. And at the end of the day, it's it's a little bit speculative, I guess, from an investor's perspective, because it's not, you know, tried and true as the multifamily is it's a little bit different but you know the numbers don't lie and the cash flow on these projects and full transparency i mean we only we only acquired the property in june and we're going through the the renovation process now but without even trying i mean the, these the previous owners were were spitting off you know 15 to almost 18% cash on cash returns without even trying in a place that was like eh. you know we come yeah. in we we do what we know how to do. We can bump and get really awesome, awesome cash flow on it. So to me, it's exactly the same as multifamily. Just a little bit tweaking some systems here or there, maybe a little bit different tools and maybe a little bit more labor intensive with the people we have to involve in contract with cleaning and turnovers and stuff. But to me, it's no different. And the cash flow for for somebody that syndicates such as yourself, I mean, we're we're syndicating the motel. You know, I'm raising money for it, and the returns look fantastic for investors. Yeah. That's amazing. I love it. That is so cool. I, I gotta, I gotta explore that a little more. So yeah. Is there a failure or a mistake that you made early on that you like look back and, and it was kind of key to your success? I, I would say the biggest mistake is that I waited so long. I I'm exactly where I'm at in life because I'm supposed to be here. I, I've come to the, I've come to the conclusion that's, that's true. What I have also found is that through, especially through GoBundance, and I initially met Jamie through a merge. I, I didn't know that I qualified for GoBundance at one point in time. So I signed up for Jamie's like intro programs. But with that, I realized that there was a lot of internal work I needed to do. And through that process, I've learned to really follow what energizes me inside and if I would have followed the things that excited and energized me back when I first started feeling those feelings, I think my life would look a lot different right now. So I would say that I won't call that a failure, but I call that a learned lesson throughout the process is to really, you know, your gut intuition, I feel like is there for a reason. And I feel like that through this process, I've really learned to, to harness that and to follow that and to listen to that. And had I done that prior to, I probably would be a lot further ahead than I am right now. But I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with where we're at. I, should, I need to, to say that. <laughs> That's cool. What's a trait you have that has served you best both in real estate and in life? Playing full out, man. I, I was just talking to, there's a girl that works in our office. And if I commit to doing something, I just need to learn just a little bit. And then I take it and I run with it and I don't stop until I achieve it. And that has been something that 
you know, through the restaurant, through real estate, like I just, I won't quit. I mean, that's for me, I'm so damn competitive with myself, less with other people, but more, more with myself. And that has been what has helped and served me the most. <laughs> there are two, uh, two stories that, that a little bit that I know about you. And I've heard that you were an MMA fighter and that you ran across Pennsylvania with a broken foot. Yeah, that was fun. Part, yeah. part of the way. So that that's a testament to what you <laughs> you just described. Cool. Is there a daily habit that brings you the most benefit? I hate to probably be a broken record for everybody else you talk to, but the morning ritual is huge. There's yeah. there's such a difference. You know, I, I I periodically would take the weekends off. You know, I have I have four young kids and one on the way. A good night's sleep is hard to come by, but the mornings where I do not practice getting up, exercising, meditating, praying, journaling, the mornings I don't do that, I feel like my day goes off very differently than than the mornings when I do. So I would say that that would be the best practice for me. Yeah. Interesting thing is I heard this very recently that uh, like brain scientists described like your brain, it's not a machine, but they said it's more like a better analogy or metaphor for your the way your mind functions is it's weather and it's always shifting it's but um yeah it makes sense that that's why we have moods and all that stuff is like our brains are always in flux so yeah spending that time to kind of reset every day makes sense that they it would have a huge benefit well and and what i've learned throughout this whole process and this journey is just intentionality and if you're not going to run your day, your day is going to run you. And the days that I, I get up on my watch and do my things intentionally, I can control my day. The days where I let right. you know, nature wake me up or my kids, whoever it be, and I don't <laughs> tackle those things in the morning. Yeah, I feel or like your email control. box. Exactly. Yeah. My life's out of control at that point. So right. totally a hundred percent. All right. Well, the book you've recommended most over the past year. The one thing by Gary Keller. Oh, cool. Good one. Do you have a favorite quote? Lose yourself in the service of others, Mahatma Gandhi. Oh, love that. Great. What was your favorite movie when you were 15? When I was 15, Top Gun. Top Gun. <laughs> you, you've obviously seen the new one. I haven't. I haven't. You haven't. Okay. No, I got young kids, man. I got I to gotta make time for myself. Right, right. I went like probably 15 years without seeing a movie when my kids were, were very young. You get it. Aside from real estate, one thing you could spend all day talking about? Personal development. Oh, cool. Is there a high school friend you'd like to say hello to? My buddy, Scott. Scott. All right. Hey. Scott. What's about to get much better? My kid's life. <laughs> oh, good, good. And finally, when are you happiest? When I'm helping other people. Cool. That's, that's what I'm at. Somebody, somebody pointed that out to me the other day. They said, you know what? I've never seen you smile any more than when you're helping somebody else. So for me, that's, that will be my answer. Service. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Great. And finally, how can listeners reach out to you? I'm really, I'm a, I have a love hate relationship with social media. I'm trying to be more on there, but I, I feel like it does more disservice for me than it does service. So honestly, just, you can reach me at dgarpsis at gmail.com. Or uh, my phone number seven one seven two zero eight zero two five three. Great, I love it. Yeah, and and we'll put that in the show notes as well. At least the spelling of your name. Um, sure. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was great. Really fascinating. You know the Belize, the the hotel. I am familiar with multifamily, and you've got a great multifamily track record. But uh, that other stuff was was cool to hear about. Cool. That was awesome being on here, man. It's like I said to you earlier, it's, it's surreal that real estate can make this conversation happen. I mean, you're, you're <laughs> a celebrity, man. And I get to talk to you. It's just super cool. Yeah. And it's 12 o'clock on a Tuesday here. So, or Wednesday, oh. Wednesday, Tuesday. Amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It was great talking to you as well. What a cool story. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks, Dave. See ya. Bye. Thank you for joining us for the Wild West Real Estate Show. If you like what we're attempting to do here, please subscribe so we can continue sharing these with you. And if you want to check out our website, it's quantumcapitalinc.com. 
You'll find podcast episodes as well as multifamily properties we're looking at and how you could potentially participate. Look forward to seeing you guys soon on the Wild West Real Estate Show. Oh, 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 oh,